and we do have a very yeah, special program. Really um, before we start, though, I have a question for everybody. Um, sh please show me by raising your hand if there's anybody in your family who likes to write. Anybody have a writer in their family? Keep your hand raised if you maybe have more than one. Anybody have more than one writer in their family? Very nice. You came to the right place. Our special guest today, Elizabeth Winfrey, hails from a family of writers. Her father was a columnist and an editor. Her grandmother was a poet. And her great great uncle is the author, was the author of 38 books. Don't say who he was. I'm not. I'm not. And also <laughs> a former president of the United States. But I'm going to let her tell you all about that. So uh, Elizabeth herself is the author of more than 60 books for children and adults. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Winfrey. So I think you all are very brave. I'm not going to talk fast, but I'm going to get you out of here in a good amount of time. But I'm hoping that there will be some questions at the end. But um, I've been touring the country for far too long, probably since the mid-80s, when I first published Castle in the Attic. And every school I went to, and every library, and every reading, almost always I got the question, where do you get your ideas? And a lot of people want, I think there's come some little secret. You know, if you just got the secret, you could write 60 stories. There are a lot of little secrets being a writer. Um, the main one is that you have to do it every day. And you have to practice it, just as if you want to do anything else. But the, the thing about most writers is they write, they start out at least writing close to their life. That does not mean they write about the White House because they live two blocks from the White House. It means that they write settings they know, but also close inside their emotional life. So I always say, if you're going to be a writer, you have to keep track of how you're feeling about things. So what I'm going to show you is how my life and my books intersect, which I hope will answer a lot of the questions about where you get your ideas. So I did grow up in Washington. Um, behind the uh, White House, we have, the, of course, the monument. And as a little kid, I used to think, wow, that's sort of like a big pencil. You just turn it over and write a book. This is one of my earliest memories. This is my butterfly dress. Um, my mother decided when I was four years old that I didn't need it anymore, and she gave it to my cousin. And that was very upsetting. And I want to write a book, a picture book, about a mother or father who goes in your room when you're in school and gets rid of your rubber band ball or your paper clip chain or your favorite whatever it is that's under your bed. That might be a little dusty, but however, it's your special thing. So early memories will come back to you. It's amazing. Really, most of my books, my early books, came from things that happened to me before the age of 12. Um, a very important part of my childhood and my life, as you'll see, and gets woven through all my books, is that I had brothers. So, the big bossy brother is named Joe, the little squishy brother over here is Ian, and I have my foot up and I'm ready to kick Ian. <laughs> Ian was trouble. I had to keep an eye on him all the time. So, I got a little bigger, and I got another brother. So here I am with three brothers, and time went on, and I ended up with five brothers. Here I am in the middle. The thing is about growing up with your family is you think you're always going to live together. It is not the case. So Joe lives in Boston. Ian lives in Kathmandu, Nepal. I live in New York. Stuart lives in California. Nikki lives in Arkansas. And Andrew who's flying off the end, lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So we're spread all over the world. So we often try to get back together and have a reunion of one sort or another. This one was a lot, 20 years after that one, as you can see. But <coughs> so that's the first part of my childhood. A lot of brothers, no sisters. The second part is that, as Carrie said, I come from a family of writers. So my aunt was a writer. My father and uncle were writers. My grandmother wrote speeches and memoirs. She rewrote the Bible for children. Um, her mother was a published poet. And her uncle wrote 38 books. And I always connected to him on that basis. He was also president of the United States. So my great-great-uncle was Theodore Roosevelt. 
the thing I love about this letter is it's to his sister and it's about one of her book of poet, one of her books of poetry. Nobody goes down the street, looks at me and says, My, you look like Theodore Roosevelt's great, great niece. It really doesn't affect my life very much, except looking back at this wave of writers. It doesn't mean you have to come from writers to be a writer. It just happened to be my life. So my father and my uncle wrote a column together called Matter of Fact. My father worked at home. I came home every afternoon, and he was working in this very messy office. And the door was closed, and I could hear his typewriter, this was long before computers, behind the door. And I always said that he had a sign on his door that said, please don't knock unless you're bleeding. <laughs> it's not actually true. It's an emotional <coughs> feeling. But there were six of us in the house. He could not afford to have us knock on the door and say, Daddy, um, have you seen my basketball? He taught me about having a wall up between your work and your family. And so we gave him a lot of space. Now, he was in Washington, and he was reporting on Supreme Court justices, and he was writing columns about the government. And so he took me to meet a few presidents. So this president was Lyndon Baines Johnson. I met him, and I met John F. Kennedy. But the whole time that he was doing all this writing, I was kind of keeping an eye on him. So my first novel is set in this place, which was a farm we had about an hour outside of Washington. My father grew up on a farm in Avon, Connecticut. He was despairing that his six children grew up in the middle of the city, and so he wanted us to have farm experiences. This was a gravel trap old farm. We called it Polecat Park, because when we first bought it, it had a family of polecats living in the basement. Now, a polecat in Maryland is just the name for a skunk. So we had to get rid of skunks. We had a big old funky pond that had turtles and, you know, snapping turtles and fish and snakes and things. And we had a barn that we, the farmer next door put his hay in and the deal was we were never supposed to jump out of the hay loft into the hay at the bottom of the barn. And my first novel, Walking Away, the grandfather in the book is very like my father and the girl's best friend comes and convinces that it hurt jump. So it's, again, we sold that farm uh, probably when I was about 12. So it's early, early memories. This is the other childhood house that I grew up in. There were six of us. This is a big old house with an enormous basement. And the deal was with my brother Joe, who was the older bossy one, is that he would run operations out of the basement. Now, if you grow up in Washington, and your father is a journalist, and his best friends are mainly spies, which is true, you do a lot of spy work in the basement. So Joe, Joe decided that we might get bombed. So he decided we had to dig a big hole in the front yard. And we all did exactly what we were told. So. We went out one day and he said, now I'm going to assign you this job and you're all going to dig this hole and we all complained because in Washington, the earth is like clay and it's extremely heavy and sticks together. That's extremely useful if you're digging a 14 foot hole. If you were digging it in sand, it would all fall into each other. But because we were digging it in clay, it was holding, but we were grumpy. So Joe said, I will fix a system. So he created a system where you put the dirt into the bucket. You shot the bucket down a hill on a wire. It hit a tree limb and emptied out, and the empty bucket came up. So then we hired all the neighborhood kids. We didn't, they all wanted to use the bucket system, so we did not dig anymore. We just managed the bucket system. So you know, say, George, you want to dig tomorrow? You better, you know, you better get working a little harder. Not only that, Joe charged them to dig. So they were all coming up with their allowance and giving him money, and that made he could buy another shovel, and who knows where my parents were. They were paying absolutely no, they were out of the country, actually. We dug this huge hole. So, of course, very early on, I wrote a teenage novel called Little Demonstration of Affection, which was all about the summer we dug the hole. We also ran a private telephone line 
through the sewers of Washington, the storm sewers, <laughs> that ended up in the house of Joe's best friend. And Joe's best friend's father happened to be deputy director of planning for the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> but we still had our phone system through that. I had written about that, but it's not yet been published. That's in books to come. So the other very early memory, as you can see, here I am, good little girl, doing something in the water on an island off the coast of New England. And when I was there that summer, at the end of it, we had a really, really bad hurricane. It was in 1954, it was Hurricane Carol. The water came in, the way Sandy did here, the water came in at high tide, and the storm surge went up over the seawall, up over our lawn, and into the living room. And we were staying with my grandmother. So my brother and I and my grandmother all went up to the second floor. And in the middle of a the hurricane, there's the eye, you know, like a donut, a hole, and everything stopped. And we could see people floating away and dogs scrabbling to hold on to pieces of wood. And it was a very searing memory, just looking out that window and seeing what was there. So, of course, I wrote a book about it 20 years later, called Belinda's Hurricane, in which the dog is named Fish Face. <laughs> and I wrote an adult novel set on that island called Island Justice, which I just put out as an electronic book. So, Again, very, very early memories. So time went on, and I began to have children. I grew up, and I got married, and I had kids. And then my books started to come from them for a while. So this is my daughter, Eliza. I don't seem to be able to put any socks on her, although I did knit her that hat. She loved her bears. And one day I went by her room, and I heard her say, Bear, I am going out. You will stay with Mrs. Duck. And there was a long silence, and she said, Bear, stop that terrible crying. You like Mrs. Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Eliza did not like her babysitter. So, of course, look what I got out of it. Bear and Mrs. Duck, Bear's Christmas Surprise, and Bear and Roly Poly, which is actually a book about adoption because Bear gets a baby sister who is a different color and bigger than he is. So all of that from listening to that little conversation, which I put on a little index card and stuck in a little box, and it was 10 years after I heard it that I wrote those books. Time went on, and I had another baby. Now, Andrew is now six foot two. Uh, he does not like me showing this picture of him in this hat. This is in shadow, Susan. And he basically, he and Eliza created a lot of my books after that. Sloppy Kisses, Catherine's Doll. That was the time Eliza liked her best friend's doll better than her best friend. <laughs> Lizzie and Carol, that was the time Eliza decided she was going to base her best friend entirely on what kind of shoes she wore. And then the best friend's club. And this friendship was crucial. So Eliza and Andrew got to be about seven and five, and Andrew started nursery school, kindergarten, I guess, from nine to three. And this lady, whose name was Mrs. Miller, had come to us every day. She was their nanny, and she had taken care of them from, you know, all day long. And she came to me and she said, look, Andrew's going to kindergarten. I need to be with babies. That's what my job is. So she was leaving us. So we gave her a party, and we gave her a present, and Andrew was sad. But I was sadder <laughs> on some level. So I went inside, and I got into those feelings. And I wrote The Castle in the Attic. So who here has read The Castle in the Attic? All right. Do you remember the name of the nanny? Do you remember? Mrs. Phillips. Mrs. Phillips. So this, you probably read this in paperback, which is for sale out there. This, uh, though the hardcover is also out there. Here we have William. Here we have The Silver Knight. Here we have Mrs. Phillips, tiny Mrs. Phillips. And here's the Silver Knight and William heading out through the forest. I love this thing. It was given to me by the publisher. Here we have the Silver Knight that originally produced this book. So I went to the Metropolitan Museum where I spent a lot of time with Andrew when he was young. And there were two boxes on either side of the cash register. And one said Knights, one dollar. And the other said Damage Knights, 50 cents. <laughs> if you want to write a book, you do not go to the Knight box. Damage nice box. So I picked up this guy, 
and his hand is held up high, but his sword is missing, cut off right at the hilt. So I thought, I'm going to have to the sword. And then I put him in my hand many days later, and I thought, what if he came alive in my hand? If you want to be a writer, what if? Crucial question. What if you came in here, and unfortunately all the adults were hanging from the ceiling. What if you came in and there was an elephant here instead of people? You know, what if is what starts stories. So, Castle in the Attic was a very popular book, and they asked me to do a sequel. So I did a sequel called The Battle for the Castle, in which there is one extremely scary rat. This is William, his best friend Jason, and Gudrun, who figures in this book and did not figure in the first book. So, as a result, this book has been traveling and traveling all around the country, and I get presents. So I went to Oklahoma, and they made me a castle. I get letters from kids all over the country. Look, we live in Erie, Pennsylvania, and we made this castle just because you wrote that book. In um, Texas, they did a play. They spent an entire year, and they wrote a play based on Castle in the Attic. And then I was invited to Scottsdale, Arizona, and I was asked to speak in the library in order to um, commemorate the new reading room. The reading room looked like this. <laughs> And they had named the tower after me. So all of that, just because you write a book and send it out, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of a, you get to be a weird kind of a celebrity when you're a writer. So my kids grew up, and then I began to follow other children around. It's looking strange. But this was a friend of mine named Maggie Spencer Field. Every Thursday, Maggie came to see me. And one day she said, I said, how are you, Maggie? She said, I am fine. There are no more monsters in my room. I said, well, were there monsters in the room? Oh, my heaven, she said they were coming in, they were going out, they were driving me crazy. I said, well, what did you do? She said, last night, I stood up on my bed and I said, everybody, out. Well, a week later, I wrote Maggie and the Monster. It took a year to publish it. Tommy DePella illustrated it, and it went around the world. <laughs> Denmark, Germany, <laughs> Japan. They did a Maggie monster that you can buy in the stores. Again, just listen to that conversation. Many years later, many years later, Tommy got in touch with me and said, why don't you write a sequel? So I wrote Maggie and the Monster Baby. And he loved it, but he got De Corbain's tendonitis. He got, he could not illustrate it. And so I put it in a bureau drawer. And then I decided to get it out a couple of years later, and I rewrote it, and that's Maya and the Monster Baby. So it would have been Maggie and the Monster Baby, and there it is. This nice person has bought it. It's for sale in the back. So, you know, again, if you go all the way back, the first conversation was five sentences long. That's all it took to get the story rolling. My daughter once said to me at the age of 20, Mom, you should write a book about somebody named Dumpy LaRue. She was standing on the corner of 42nd and 8th. I don't know what came into her head, but it started immediately. Dumpy LaRue wanted to dance. You're a pig, said his father. Pigs don't dance. They bellow, they swallow, they learn how to wallow. But Dumpy LaRue was a pig who knew what he wanted to do. He twirled in the sky, raised his snout to the sky, spread his hoops far and wide, and pretended to fly. Dumpy gets the whole barnyard dancing, including these five gray rats. I looked at this picture for a long time. Betsy Lewin did the art here. She did Click Clack Moo Cows the Type. She's a brilliant artist. And these rats had so much energy. I mean, look at this one. So I decided, first of all, I thought they remind me of something. And of course, that's <laughs> rats, Benny, Fletcher, Ella, Woody, and Monk. And Ella, so let's see if we can get them. Ella is this one, right in the middle of four brothers. I just gave her four brothers. But the important thing was I made her the hero of the book. So 
So Ella is the hero of the Red Hot Ratchets. This is my praise song to New York City. It's the only book I've set to Wamanasatru. I did two Miranda books, but this one was my most recent I Love New York book. And, as usual, I'm in the Metropolitan Museum a lot. So the rats, through various adventures, they end up dancing on the stage in Radio City Music Hall, okay? But they have a lot of adventures before. They get through the fountain when it was running in those days, and Monk almost dies in the fountain. They get him out, then they have to hide under the hot dog stand. They finally get into the museum, and the whole point of this is that Fletcher is an art aficionado, and he is going to look for a picture of a rat in the Metropolitan Museum. I spent many months looking for a picture of a rat. I came out and said, there are no pictures of rats in the Metropolitan Museum. This is appalling. I called my brother, who lives in Kathmandu. He said, go look for a Ganesh, which is it's a Hindu, I think it's a Hindu elef elephant. Yes. It rides, always carried by four rats, not the Ganeshes in, in the Metropolitan Museum. So I gave this show in a New York City school, and one of the teachers decided she would take her class to the Met, and she was damned if she was going to find a rat. She found two rats. <laughs> there is one on a very tiny Japanese knife in the weapons department. I, I defy you to find this rat. And there's one in a broil. Now, I looked at this painting, and I did not see the rat. <coughs> you might also have a little problem finding the rat. It's you still might have a little problem finding a rat. It's right here, <coughs> eating this dead fish. So that was a fantastic experience for me to have to have them do that. So here I am, squashed in the middle of these brothers. So of course I had to write a book called Squashed in the Middle, in which Daisy has an extremely irritating older sister and an even more annoying younger brother. Then my writing took a turn. And I began to write more from a historical perspective. I was asked to write a book about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a president who was president of America during the Great Depression. I set it in the Northeast in a mill town near where we lived at that time. And the little girl, Emma Bartoletti, is the daughter of Italian immigrants. And she is writing to Franklin Roosevelt to say, look, this is what this really feels like on the ground. This is how hard it is to be in this depression, and he writes her back. Creating his letters was, oddly enough, not hard for me, because my grandmother, in the funny hat on the left, was Eleanor Roosevelt's first cousin. So they had, they, she had played with Franklin as a child, so they had a voice that I could connect to. It was Emma Bartoletti that was harder for me to get. And so I did a huge amount of research. And during that time, I learned a lot about textile factories in the Northeast and mills. And in the Depression, the adults worked there. But if you went back 20 years earlier, the children worked in the textile factories. This is a picture by a famous photographer named Louis Hine, who is known for his child labor pictures. And I saw it in a museum, and I thought, I really want to write a book about this girl. She is, her name is Addie. That's all we knew about her. Her feet are covered in grease. Her, her smock is the only one she has. She probably has something called rickets, because her arm is very strangely bent. Um, and rickets means you, aren't getting, you don't get enough vegetables. She has um, very, her job, 12 hours a day, six days a week, is to be a doffer. That means she has to do off the bobbins. Her mother shuts down the machine. Her mother is put on the loose pulley, which means that she is not paid. And this little girl has to run along taking one off and putting a new one on. So this, this one comes off, that one goes on. This one comes off all the way down. And she probably changes something like 136 at one time, all the way from one end of the machine to the other. She's paid $2.50 a week. That is probably about $50 a week now. The mill owners, she's from Canada. The mill owners loved little kids from Canada. French Canadians were Catholic. 
They had a lot of kids. They'd bring them all down on the trains to Vermont and New Hampshire and Massachusetts. And the kids could clean the machines with their fingers. When the machine was off, they could snake their fingers in and out. They didn't have to pay them a lot. They could be cleaners on the floor, etc. So there were a lot of kids that worked in these mills. In pa North Panel, Vermont, where, where Addie worked, there she is there, she has a big sister. And all, look how many kids don't have shoes. Look at these guys up here who are trying to convince you they've got a great baseball team going. A lot of them are smoking. None of them are in school. None of them went to school after about the age of 10 or 11. And I began to people my book, which was totally fiction, based on the photographs and based on the research, with faces here. So look at the lint covering their clothes. Again, the bare feet. Um, this guy in the back, I love, with the black hat, he looks like he's sort of saying, you know, don't worry about me, I'm just doing fine, thank you very much. And this little boy got, he just looked to me like somebody knew how bad this really was. The others were saying, ah, we don't care, we kind of hate school anyway, blah, blah. But this little boy looked scared and worried, so I made him my character's best friend. So I named the little girl Grace, and I named him Arthur, and I wrote a book called Counting on Grace. Usually when I'm finished a book, I'm finished the book. And I handed it in to the publisher. But in this case, I kind of was haunted by this little girl. She, her face is iconic. She was on a stamp in 1998. She was in a Reebok ad about child labor 10 years ago. Her face has been published all over the world, and nobody knew who she was. So I went and did a huge amount of research, took me a while, and I found her. She was no longer alive. I met her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, and they told me about her life. And they gave me a picture of her at the age of 93. So if you look back, to look, that little girl lived to 93. And I said to her granddaughter, what did she die of? And she said, died of lung cancer. And I said, well, it was probably the mill. She said, I hate to tell you, she smoked two packs. <laughs> <laughs> but she lasted a really long time. She was very plucky. So I think something about this made me begin to investigate my own childhood and my own history. So my father and my uncle, as I said, were partners. And uh, there was a play that came out on Broadway last week, last April, called The Columnist by David Auburn. And that was based on my father and my uncle. Um, the man did not know them, and he wrote fiction. But I decided that I would look back through my own childhood, my relationship with my own father, who taught me how to shoot. He took me to the Democratic Convention in 1968, and I wrote about the two of them and what their relationship really was like and how it was connected to me. Now, you remember this little girl with her twin bears. Well, she grew up and got married, and she had these two. So these are Sonia and Eve, and my new book, which is coming out probably next year, is called Twins. So again, I'm writing right close to my life. I have a new crop of children I can follow around. Uh, <laughs> Last week, um, their father was taking care of them, and their mother was going to the airport. She called and said, so how are the girls? He said, I don't know. I've, I've actually been asleep. She said, you what? Where are the girls? And he said, they're downstairs in the basement, but it's OK. They're quiet. She said, no, it's not. <laughs> he went downstairs, and the entire floor was covered with blonde hair. Sonia had cut Eve's hair, and Eve had cut Sonia's hair. And in the middle, they cut My Little Pony's hairs. So the whole place was like a barber shop. Now, that would be a great picture book, except I don't think a lot of parents would like it. So I had to find a way to write it. The book I just finished in the last month is a long family history that I'm writing that I is with a reader right now and is going to my agent in the next month or so. 
the reason I'm doing it is that my father was famous, and my uncle was famous, and everybody interviewed them, and blah, blah. But nobody ever asked my mother about her life. And my mother grew up in Gibraltar. And she was evacuated from Gibraltar. She witnessed one of the first battles of the Spanish Civil War. She was evacuated to England. She worked as a decoding agent for MI5 in London at the age of 17. And she had a pretty amazing life. And she married my father at the age of 18 in June 20th, 1944, uh, just after a buzz bomb had come through. So she, she had an amazing life. When I asked her about this dress, she said to me, well, darling, that was my tennis dress. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, it was wartime. Your father got leave. He had, we had five days. We had no time to find any white material. And so I was married in my tennis dress. <laughs> That's the kind of plucky person she was. So, I, don't, I had a great title for the book, and I just found out there's another book with that title coming out next month. It's called, I was calling it My Mother's Wars, Decoding the British Childhood, but it is, so I'm open for suggestions. <laughs> so that's what's just been done, and that's the show. Now, questions? Do we have any? Yes, I like this. Speak um, to me. On the back of this, what's jumping the train? Oh, so you haven't read Battle for the Castle yet. This is scary. So um, I have a friend who told me that when he was 12, he had a thing that he did in his upstate town in New York that was to prove he was brave and strong. The trains would come into his um, station nearby, and they would go under the train. Stopped. It would fill up with passengers, and they had to go under it and get to the other side. Well, that was so scary, I decided I couldn't write that. So I and my character, William and Jason, have to go up over the train and down the other side. It's a kind of a really, I need to tell you, stupid thing that kids do to feel like they're strong and brave. And William, at the very end, decides it's really stupid, and he doesn't do it. And so he and Jason forever are on one side of the tracks. Jason's on this side of the tracks, William's on this side, and, and it, emotionally he feels that he and his best friend have this huge break between them. So that's what starts the whole story. So we'll find out more. Yeah? How many books have you Okay, so I've published 62 books, I think. Um, but I've written some that haven't gotten published. I've probably written 15 that the publisher, or maybe more, says, no, thank you, we don't really want this book. It makes me grumpy. <laughs> I put it in a drawer, and I usually get it out and try and rewrite it and send it out again. You know, that's what's different now, is if I really think it's good, I can publish it myself as an e-book. But the thing about e-books is, a lot of the books I've written are very short, and I'm not an illustrator. So I would have to get an illustrator. We're learning how expensive it can be to create a, a e book. So I'm having a little more, a little less grumpy with publishers than I used to be, because they can do a lot of the work. Yeah. How many chapters are in this book? I don't know. You look it up and tell me. I can't remember. Does it look awfully long to read? It'll go very fast. I trust it. Trust me. Librarians, yes. Will you write an autobiography by, about yourself? That's a good question. I think I will. Um, so the family history about my mother stops at the point when my mother has to cross the North Atlantic in a convoy in December of 1944, pregnant with my oldest brother Joe, um, and it she lands in America, and my father comes over on the QE2 and lands in America. And the book ends right there. But my childhood, from you, what you heard, digging the hole, running the sewer line, we had a lot of pretty amazing adventures. And I have done one very short essay about that, but I think I'm going to probably expand it to a book. Good question. Yes? Um, 17 chapters. 17 chapters. There's a report from the back row. Castle in the attic. How many times did you 
process? Yeah. So, Pass on the Attic was a real change for me because up until then, I outlined. And I think my books were kind of tight as a result. In that book, I got the whole idea in one day when I was swimming laps, oddly enough, and I remember trying to make notes by the swimming pool in the White Institute to know that ballpoint pens don't work around chlorine. <laughs> so I wasn't working. And so I just took the story home in my mind and I just scribbled down the ideas and wrote it. And it, it, it meant that I didn't get too kind of um, wedded to what it was. So I turned it into my publisher. It took me a year to write it. And originally, I had written a book about a picture book, sort of Goodbye, Mrs. Miller, <laughs> you know, practically the name of it. And my editor said, it's as if you follow her around with a microphone, and Andrew around with a microphone. This is not a story. It's what happened to you. You need to make it happen another way. And she was right. So I, I did the whole book. I found the night and put it all together. I turned it in, and she said, it's good, but there is a bully in it that pre foreshadows Alistair, who's the villain in the book. And she said, he doesn't really have any other purpose. I think you need to take him out. Now, if you build a book, you know, and you take out a character, it's as if I suddenly said, well, you know, I'm sorry, Mark, but about, you know, four inches of this room is going to have to come out. Then you have to make sure this goes. Then you have to rebuild the walls so that the roof fits. You really rebuild the book for the end. But my revision process is much faster than my writing process because I've got so much on the page. So in that case, it took about four months. Counting on Grace, huge amount of research. Pulled down into the book, took me a year. And the revision took me a month. Now, I'm weird that way. A lot of people work in writers groups and they like to get a lot of input and reaction. I've gotten weird about this. It's like, I don't want to hear from anybody. You know, I just want to hear my own voice, and then I'll put it out, which is a little scary, because, you know, my, read, my book's out 312 pages with a reader right now, and she says, oh, my God, I went totally wrong at page 20. But it's still, that's what works for me. I would get thrown off if I listened to too many critiques during the process of the book, whereas other people love it, you know. So that's more my problem. I did talk to my father about writing, and uh, he did live to see the first draft of Walking Away. Now, my father had some very funny habits. One of them was that he had an old rug that was an obusoft, which was some kind of very fancy French rug that he bought when he was dropped into France during the Second World War. He managed to get this old rug out and home. Well, we would run across this rug with our boots and pull it apart. So Daddy would sit on the floor in tailor position and sew it back up again. And uh, mind you, he never sewed a button or anything. And in fact, later on in his life, he discovered this thing called flow sew, which turned out to be glue. So he would sort of push it together with the flow sew, and, and after the rug was really in total tatters, my mother said we had to get rid of this rug. It had to be scraped off the floor. <laughs> but in the book, in walking away, the grandfather sits on the floor and sews up his rug. So my father wrote in the in one of the margins, you know, I'm not very many people do this. This is kind of odd. <laughs> you know. But the other thing he did, which was very helpful, was, you know, my very first book and I wrote, literally. Emily walked to the door, grasped the doorknob, turned the doorknob, opened the door, and walked through. And he wrote in the column in the margin. Unless Emily crawls bleeding from the room, I suggest you say Emily left the room. We all leave a room in approximately the same way. <laughs> so that was that was kind of an amazing thing. He did he wrote a memoir which actually we're putting up online called Stay of Execution, because when he was 60, 57 years old, he was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia. And he died when he was 60. 
And his editor had the chutzpah to say to him, why don't you write a book about what it feels like to be dying, which was very early on, before any of the other memoirs. And uh, I had to edit that book for him. And in it, he talks about his six children, in these small encapsulated paragraphs, and he talks about me and how much, how I um, live in an apartment in which it is difficult to swing a full-grown cat. However, <laughs> I still go every night to this little tiny desk and I write from five to six. So clearly, she, if nothing else, perseverance will get her published. So he did, he knew that it was being continued. Um, he was definitely, you know, a big influence. And I wish to God he knew everything that came after. So, any more questions or should we all? All right, I am happy to sign books. There is also a flyer out there, I've given them out a few of my two electronic books. If you're a Kindle reader for adults, uh, Don't Knock Unless You're Bleeding is online, and Island Justice is also online. Thank you.